Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. My name's David. I was a shepherd boy, the youngest of seven. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader, and from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. declared to me through the prophet. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him. So now, I charge you in the sight of all Israel, and of the assembly of the Lord and in the hearing of our God. Be careful to follow all the commandments of the Lord your God, that you may possess this good land and pass it on as in inheritance to your descendants forever. And I instructed Solomon my son and pled to those who came after to acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And these are the sons of David, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amon, Josiah. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. I am Ahaz. I do not cower to prophets like my fathers. Certainly not Isaiah. That old man of Judah, he doesn't know what the rest of the world knows. I shut the temple. Now everyone can praise the gods of the lands around us. A shrine on every corner. The gods require splendor. The gods require human sacrifice. The gods require our children. Well, hey, welcome to the Foundry today. As we dive in, I want to put a shameless plug in for a venue, and you think, oh, Steel Rooster. No, I'm, I'm tricking you. Um, I, I, the message. This is a great time to come out and experience uh, the Foundry Church in a totally different setting. Today, we ate Pumba, the pig from Lion King. So it's also kind of Disney-centered, so kids are welcome, too. It's a little more tearful for them, but it was delicious. 
That was an awesome pig. Anyways, um, welcome to the Foundry. As we dive in today, we look today at King Ahaz, and I will tell you this, as we lean in to Ahaz and his story, what we lean into is one of the darkest episodes in Scripture. What we find in King Ahaz is everything, well, we hope we never are. So listen just a little bit with me as we unpack who he was. King Ahaz, when he took the throne at a young age, he kind of came into power and, well, I think he was 20 years old when he got on the throne. He comes into power and um, and immediately it seems like he's under siege. He faces a siege from Rezin, king of Aram, and uh, from Pekah, son of Ramallah, king of of Ramaliah, king of Israel. And he comes under siege and he does something interesting. He reaches out to tiglath Pileser, which to us were like, who is he pleasing? Like that just doesn't make sense, right? But tiglath Pileser is the king of Assyria, the most ruthless, long-standing um, kind of dynasty and empire in the ancient world. And he reaches out to them and he says, look, I'm a vassal of yours. I pay tribute to you. I'm under siege. Help me. Help me. tiglath Pileser does help him. He comes and he lays waste to the king of Damascus. He lays waste to the northern tribes of Israel. And he subdues them on behalf of Ahaz. Ahaz goes to Damascus to meet tiglath Pileser as a vassal king to go pay homage to him. When he gets there, he sees this beautiful, ornate altar. And he's just taken by it. He thinks it's amazing. So he has, like an engineer or an architect, draw up the exact and specific dimensions of this. He has it drawn up and sketched out, and he sends those details back to Uriah, who was the high priest in Israel, and he says, construct this. When he gets back, he has it placed in the temple of the Lord. He moves the bronze altar of the temple of the Lord out and puts in his altar. He offers sacrifices on it, and he does say this, I'm going to keep the bronze altar of God because I want to seek guidance, so put it over there at the north gate, but this goes where the old altar went. He starts doing things that you see undermine not only God's law and his word, but the worship of him. And Ahaz goes throughout his life getting worse and worse. This was the beginning to a very bad king, a very bad season in the monarchy. What we see in Ahaz is someone who eventually shuts the doors of the temple. He closes the gates of the temple of God, and in the end there are, as he says, shrines on every corner. On every corner, there is shrines to worship other gods, the gods of the lands around them. Under every spreading tree, we'll talk about that in a while, on every high place, he closes the temple and he turns his people in towards the pantheon of pagan gods that surrounded Israel because they were surrounded by, well, pagan lands. So the reality of what he did is he completely drove the people far away from God. And in every corner, he committed himself to the complete apostasy of worship. He worshiped everything but the true God. And today when we talk about Ahaz and read about Ahaz, what I want to do in this is understand that for you and for me, this is a very troubling story. But it's not isolated like we can look at him like we do in the modern context. Well, at least I'm not Hitler, right? And we kind of, he's that kind of guy. At least I'm not Ahaz. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Let's not be so quick to dismiss ourselves from needing the the microscope of God in our life, but let's also not be quick to dismiss God's love for us. So as we dive in today, I invite you to uh, read with me. If you have your Bibles, open them up to 2 Kings chapter 16. If you don't, words are on the screen. You can follow with me as I read. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Remaliah, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel. He even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. 
He offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places, on the hilltops, and under every spreading tree. When I was in high school, an album came out. And it was, and back then it was an album, right? It didn't drop on iTunes, it was an album. And, um, and this, this record comes out, and uh, it's by a band that was kind of unheard of, but it had a name that caught my ear. I'll never forget it. I, I remember seeing the, the, the title of the album, and it was Appetite for Destruction. Anybody remember that one? Yeah, Guns N' Roses. And yeah, they just, I mean, yeah, everybody's like, oh, yeah, Guns N' Roses. I mean, not in church, clearly, but yeah, totally listen to it. Um, and uh, with, with that title, it, I, I think it was just, as a young teenage boy, it's weird. You kind of have a weird appetite for destruction. Like, hey, that's kind of pretty. Crack. Oh, look, I can break it. Like, you just, it's, you don't, I don't even know how to say it. There is something about that that um, appealed to me as a 15 to 17-year-old guy who was just kind of in that phase in life where you're coming into your prime, you're stronger, and this appetite for destruction. And I just kind of was intrigued with just the title of it. It wasn't my kind of music at the time, but I was intrigued by it. Today I want to talk to us about the appetite of evil. The appetite of evil, and say this and make very clear, the appetite of evil, evil being anything that puts itself up against God and kind of pushes or tries to separate what God loves from God and opposes God, trying to set itself up as God. So, so I would say in this Satan, the devil, anything that opposes God and sets itself up as its own God is evil. And evil has an appetite. And I will say this, from the beginning of time till right now, the appetite of evil has not changed. The appetite of evil absolutely has not changed. It is an all-consuming appetite that will devour anything in its path. It's never satisfied. It'll never be enough and it only wants more, more, more. Evil eats us alive if we allow it. Its appetite is completely unyielding. And the reality of this is seen in so many ways. So here's, here's what I want to do. I want to look at this in the ancient kind of the context of antiquity, but also look at it in the context of our own kind of modernity, I guess, our own modern day, and look at it juxtaposed, and you tell me whether the appetite of evil has changed. Because I know this. When we look at the lines of Ahaz in that, in that video, that the gods require splendor. Silver, gold are best. The gods require human sacrifice. Uh, it turns a dark corner quick, right? And then the gods require blood. They want our children. When you look at that and you see the appetite of evil, we, we understand this, that evil's appetite is for the destruction of life. The destruction of life is the goal of evil, continually. Continually the destruction of life is what we find ourselves wrestling with in our day and age. And I want to talk with you about it because in this, we need to look at the practices that Ahaz took part in. So when we talk about Ahaz, as it said, um, he followed the ways of the kings and the lands around Israel. He even sacrificed his son, would have been his firstborn son, the heir to the throne of the king of the throne of David, he sacrificed his firstborn son to what? To the god Molech. Molech is an ancient god way back in history. It's a Canaanite god. And um, the, some of the Israelites had syncretized their, their faith with this. And what had happened is you would take your firstborn and you would put it into the fire that burned in the belly of Molech. It was a god fashioned in such a way that had a fire in its belly, and they would feed their children into it for one express purpose, to ensure financial prosperity. And we just think, oh, thank God we don't live in a culture like that. Thank God we don't live in a culture where any harm comes to children for financial gain. And then you kind of have to pull the brakes and go, oh my gosh, the appetite of evil has never changed. 
And we'll talk more about it. But that's one of the ways we can see that he did what was not only detestable in the eyes of God, but he did everything that would oppose the heart of God. He took life to ensure getting prosperity that, well, it won't last with him into eternity. He wanted prosperity over the gift that God had given him in this life of this young child. So we look at it and we realize, oh my goodness, he's godless. His God is his appetite. His God is his desires. So when we look at that, we get this kind of strange feeling of like, oh, but then let's look at the immorality of his life. He burned incense on the high places. Just pagan worship. Pagan worship turning his attention and his eyes away from God. And you may think it's no big deal, but think of the time and energy it takes to climb Sleeping Bear Dunes, right? To get to a high place. Did you know in Michigan right now, uh, the fine currently, because the lake has come up so much at Sleeping Bear Dunes, the lake has come up so that it's so hard to get rescues down there that if you call 911 and get rescued from the base of the big dune down at Sleeping Bear, it's $2,200 to come haul your carcass up out of the sand because you couldn't make the trek up. Don't tell me that worship doesn't remove from us the energy and the ability to pursue what God wants. He would climb the mountains to go up and offer sacrifices. He would pursue with great passion and personal effort the worship of other gods. It's problematic at best, and it shows his heart was anywhere but in the temple where God had chosen to dwell at that time. So we can look at that and realize not only is he apostate, he makes great effort to be so, but then we see he has, there's this language around this, and I want you as adults to work with me in this if you're in the room and you're kind of um, past that uh, young age. Read into this heavily, please. He would go to every spreading tree. Spreading trees were signs of fertility, And to do worship to gods of fertility, you did fertile things, right? Do we get like, yeah, I'm not, it's not okay. You know, it's that kind of stuff. Like it was messed up. But he would go and he would worship at the spreading trees. He committed acts of immorality to be more fertile. Is anybody else like playing in the irony here? Didn't you feed your firstborn to the fire? How can you ask God for more? You can just see appetite, the appetite of evil has not changed. And I will tell you this. I have spent time in hill tribes north of Chiang Mai, Thailand, where we went into a hut that was three hours off any kind of paved road. And you walk into a thatched hut, and the dude's watching a little TV that's like this big, and you're like, you have TV? And you look out on top, and there's a satellite. And you're like, no way. You know, they're like, they're like watching Sabado Gigante or something. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't be Spanish speaking. But anyways, um, they're watching TV. And I remember saying to the pastor, they have TV. And he'd be like, no, 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 no. He wouldn't really talk about it. I'm like, why? And um, there was a picture of a few pictures in there. There was a picture of one child. And I, I didn't see that one. I said, there. And, uh, and he went, go, go. And the translator told me he sold that girl into the trades in Bangkok for a satellite. And I just remember having this sick feeling in my guts that you're watching television with a picture of the daughter you put into the trade of human trafficking for your comfort. For your comfort. Remember, Molech, they would feed their firstborn into because of what? They wanted to ensure prosperity, financial prosperity. Do you know the number one reason given for abortion in the United States? Because of the statistical probability of poverty for a single mom who had a child in teenage years. And they say, for financial feasibility in your life, for the practicality of what this child will do, we recommend abortion. Now, not all abortion happens on that scale, and I get that, but I want to speak to this. The appetite of evil hasn't changed, and I will say this. This church is pro-life, but don't start clapping yet. We are pro-life from the, from the, the womb to the grave, 
And there is no human being on this planet that doesn't bear the image of God and doesn't deserve our voice and our advocacy, right? And we do that on an ascending scale. Those who have no voice get our loudest voice. And for, for me, that's babies unborn, children who are sold for some sort of gain into the slave trades of garment makers, into the slave trades of other things going on that um, equal the fertility cults. And you may think, yeah, well, I'm glad I don't live in Thailand. Has anybody else here noticed what's been going on in our towns? What's been going on in West Michigan around tulip time? What goes on around the Super Bowl? It's very dangerous because there's traffickers. There's people taking human beings and trafficking them out for profit and prosperity. We have to understand the appetite for evil has never changed. It's been the same since the very beginning. God said, if you eat of the fruit of that tree, surely you will die. And Satan said, eat of it, eat of it. The destruction of life. The destruction of life has always been the appetite of evil. But, but, there is hope even amid this darkness because the love of God hasn't changed either. The love of God for his people and those who are still far away from him has not changed. It's why I say to you as a church, if you're not evangelistic here, if you don't tell people about Jesus, lead them, try to get them towards Christ, you're in the wrong church because God died for them. We'll keep putting up new venues, doing whatever we can to make room for the people who are far from God to come near. I don't care what it takes. We'll do it because God loves them and he will provide a way because the love of God has never changed. The love of God is unchanging. God values life. He values relationship and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us in order to reconnect in relationship. The love of God not only hasn't changed, but it's been given to us through the covenant of Christ. So we look at this and we go, okay, if the love of God hasn't changed, what then do we hold on to? So today, so when, when we're in the message service, um, I know you're seeing this on a Sunday, but today I believe is the 25th of July or Christmas in July, right? The lamest idea I've ever heard. I don't want it to be Christmas, it's so cold, right? But um, the other day, Pastor Tom Grable was leading a devotion and he talked about Christmas in July. And I was like, oh yeah, that's a thing. I hadn't really thought about it. Um, it's amazing because, you know, you think of like the Christmas story. How weird would it be if I turned to you in this teaching and I said to you, um, I want to tie in a verse. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And you're like, aren't we in Ahaz in the Old Testament? Why are you being weird and bad at preaching today, right? You'd wonder, like, why that scripture? Why, why would you tie that in? Why would that be the place we turn? Well, strangely enough, Isaiah was a contemporary of Ahaz. And into the darkness, we hear God speak. Isaiah 7, 1 to 14. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem. And uh, now the house of David, and he could not overpower it. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. When the thunderstorm comes through and the trees are like, oh, that they were quaking in their boots. Their knees were knocking together. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, and to go meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool. <coughs> go out and meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct on the road to the launderer's field. Isn't that funny? Go to the coin wash and meet Ahaz. I mean, that'd be the modern, co I just think that's awesome. I didn't know there were launderers fields. Um, he said, and it goes on to say, say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. 
Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, and of the son of Remaliah, Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son, have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Blows my mind. This wicked king, God's still reaching out. The love of God compels him to reach out through the prophet Isaiah. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of the ram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin, which is kind of a slight, you know, like if you hear something at the door late at night, and you're like, oh, what is it? Oh, my gosh, you know, and then you see, like, oh, it's only a squirrel. It's no big deal. It's only resin. It's only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim too will be shattered, will be too shattered to be a people. And if we look at the timeline, 722, the entire northern 10 tribes are taken off into captivity by Assyria, who Tiglath-Pileser is king over. The head of Ephraim is is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. They don't even give him a name. You know, it's just a weird furry thing at the door at this point. I mean, they're just, it's so awesome. If you don't stand firm in your faith now, you will not stand at all. Ask the Lord. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. (gasps) What's God saying there? Go ask me. Make an effort like you do in the other places. Come talk to me. Ask me for a sign. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. If you have a puke bag, this is where you grab it and fill it. Because that is the kind of snarky thing. Remember what he did? He climbed the high places. He did everything he could to burn incense and do things that are detestable in the eyes of God. But he was so arrogantly opposed to God. He's like, oh, I won't put the Lord to the test. Oh, it's just bristles me. It drives me nuts. I can't stand it. Then Isaiah says, and this is awesome. I love this about Isaiah. He's like, here now, you house of David. Is it not enough that you try the patience of humans, that you tick people off all the time? Will you try the patience of my God also? (laughs) So Isaiah's picking teams, right? It gets so good right now. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Virgin giving birth means what? It's a firstborn son. What did Ahaz do with his? In apostasy for his own gain, he threw him into the fire. And God's desire for worship, for connection, for relationship and love means that he promised, well, that there will be a son born to the virgin, a firstborn. And God will restore relationship through him. You will actually call him God with us, Emmanuel. How dope. Can you say dope in church? How dope. Not that I encourage it in any way. But how amazing is it that in the life of Ahaz, God says that. God says that. Like in my mind, I just, like as I was working on this, I just like, it just blew my mind. I'm like, why now? Why now? Maybe you've walked through a dark room before, and you walk in, and you're like, I can't, I can't see anything. You're like, oh, my gosh, it's inky black. And you take out your phone, and you light your way. Anybody else ever do that? The only truly good use for a smartphone is, that, you know, you, you kind of like you, you find your way through the darkness. That little bit of light just opens a pathway. Imagine what that pinprick of light a promise of God did in the darkness of the reign of Ahaz. It said this, the appetite of evil is unyielding. It will swallow everything if it can. The more you feed it, the more it wants. It will never be satisfied until destruction is complete, until all life is ruined. But here's the thing. Let's go back to it. The love of God hasn't changed. The love of God hasn't changed. It has never shifted. And we can hold on to this and know that because God loved us, he gave us a promise in the life of Ahab, Ahaz through the life 
of the prophet Isaiah. And he said that I will anchor you to myself in relationship in Christ, the eternal son of God. I will give you myself, the best of me to restore relationship. I will not put to destruction anything else if you would only come to me. And here's how you can get here. The love of God hasn't changed. For us, the church, we hold on to it like we hold on to a sure and steady rope. You know, when we're trying to go on a rope swing, nobody's like this. Look at me, hold with my elbows. Nobody would do that. You'd be like on AFV. Be terrible. You get a good grip. We hold on to those promises that the goodness and the love of God hasn't changed, that he remains who he promised he would be. Why? Why? I think the Apostle Paul says it well in Romans 5, 6 through 8. You see, just at the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, while the the same appetite for evil lived in us, Christ died. He died while we were in sin without the guarantee of us coming close. And the hope for you and I is this, that you and I, just like Ahaz, need to come to Christ. If we're going to be restored, if we're going to be given purpose and vision and a reason in this life, it only comes through Christ. And the love of God and its fullest expression will always be in eternity, in perpetuity, forever, Jesus Christ. So I invite you today, if you don't know him, run to him. If you do know him, he should be the story you're telling everyone. Make no excuse that the appetite of evil is out for the people you think, oh, maybe they'll see Jesus through me. They need to know Jesus. They need to hear about him from you. You need to be the living embodiment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because while you were a sinner, while evil was eating up all it could through your life, Christ died on your behalf. And the promise for you and I is this, that we are loved. And in Christ's love, we are made purposeful and made alive in him. There is no sin, no brokenness, and no destruction that the love of Christ can not only forgive, but redeem. He can redeem it. If you're in this place and you feel the weight of a thousand years because of the the loss of a child intentionally, because of a a failed marriage, because of um, the loss of friendships, because of all these things, because of a very broken sexual ethic and there's been perversion secretly or out in the open and you're sitting here going, God could never love someone like me. In the heart of the reign of Ahaz, God said this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and that son will be God with us. He hasn't left yet. Let us not ever forget But the burdens we bear, he died to redeem. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and we give you thanks for who you are and the work you're doing in our lives. So we ask, would the love of God please flow into our hearts and our minds? Would we be filled with the goodness and the peace of Christ in this day as we live forward confidently knowing that it was you, Christ, who died for us while we remained in sin. May we remain there no more but run into your glorious light. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now, and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today, and we cannot wait to see you again next week.